So this week we're looking at Smile, which is our second Michael Ritchie film. It's made in 1975, the American Bicentennial. Was it that year or the next year? <laughs> I don't know. You got me there. I don't, I don't know American history. I think it was... <laughs> what? 75? Yeah, I chose this one. And it's been on top of my list since Shane came up with this idea for this podcast. Um, it is literally the definition of a lost movie, which is odd because yeah. it's an American mainstream movie with, you know... A, a then fairly bankable actor um, and it's really good but the only way I've ever seen to buy it is uh, a non-anamorphic DVD edition from like the late 90s which has um, a, an old Laserdisc transfer on it doesn't seem to be available to stream anywhere it's weird it's just completely gone uh, so is there an anamorphic version of it because yeah this 1 8 185 version is really kind of it feels old really sort of crushed yeah, yeah. it's really old as I, I think it's an old Laserdisc transfer because those are always letterboxed. Um, and then in the, in the early days of DVD, they used to just recycle those transfers, especially for budget releases. Mm. So I don't think it's been transferred since like the mid to late 90s. Oh, that's frustrating, especially with a cinematographer like Conrad Hall doing, doing some really lovely work. We've talked about Michael Ritchie in our earlier podcast on Downhill Racer, so don't necessarily need to go through his whole career again. Uh, yeah, I guess we're just ever so slightly closer to his move into uh, you know blockbuster comedy his, his next movie after this was Bad News Bears which I think was his first proper big hit which was like a family friendly comedy but I, I really like I probably said this before I really like Michael Ritchie's 70s movies I think he's kind of like an unsung auteur of the decade he's kind of like a sober Hal Ashby um, he makes these kind of fairly socially conscious uh, slightly comedic observational movies about about contemporary culture in America in the 70s and I, I honestly think the reason that he isn't kind of talked about in in the same kind of with the same breathless admiration even though he had kind of like the same hit to miss ratio as Ashby at the box office is because I think he moved over to the mainstream and made some fairly appalling mainstream movies um, but was successful at it yeah that's he it kind of tainted his 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 reputation as as a serious filmmaker by doing that and being successful at it. Yeah, and I think um, Richie kind of gives up that wonderful technique that he has in Downhill Racer and this. You know, his kind of it's fragmented edits where he's moving through a space and observing all the kind of characters on the peripheries whilst the action's happening. I think all of that stuff that that technique is gone by the time he moves into Fletch and. Fletch Lives and Golden Child. He did have a, a sort of comeback movie called, um, I think it was called Digstown? Midnight Sting it was released as, but it was originally called Digstown. Yeah, and that was that was his one of, like, consciously a more serious movie, even though it's fairly lightweight and, and entertaining and a little bit of a caper. It is. It was kind of his conscious return to being good. So I saw this first, I think, on a late-night TV screening. Um... I think it was probably my first Michael Ritchie movie. Oh, right, okay. Um, it was it was back in the old days when Time Out London used to have a very comprehensive film guide for the week. Oh yeah, okay. So it was you, on TV. Yeah, but they all they used to do all the films for the day, and if there was something good, they would flag it up. I remember this mm -hmm. being this being flagged up, and then you know setting the VCR to record it, um, and really really loving it. I think it was this that led me on to the the candidate and stuff like that. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, and then it kind of sat on tape for years, and when DVD came along, there was an American release, but um, I didn't get to pick it up until uh, I picked it up in a bargain bin in Amoeba Records in Berkeley in 2006. <laughs> wow, that's <laughs> my, specific. My memory tells me. 2006 or 2009, I can't remember which visit it was. Um, and have had it on DVD since, and I think this is the first time we dusted it off to watch it. Um, since I got that, three dollars ninety nine in a, in Amoeba. All right, nice. Don't forget the cost of the flight, so I'm sure it offsets. Well, it wasn't specifically to buy this disc. <laughs> I was, there was a honeymoon involved as well. Oh, right, so. okay, okay, fair um, enough. Yeah, so that was that was how I saw it, and I really liked it. It was I was kind of getting into seventy cinema at the time, and I really liked it. it's kind of like fragmented, jumpy, but colourful, kind of engaging and enjoyable as well. Uh, yeah, I like the kind of weird non-structure structure to it. Is this your first viewing? Yeah, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm new to Michael Ritchie. The first Michael Ritchie I'd seen was Prime Cut and didn't really enjoy. And then when we looked at Downhill Racer, that blew me away. So I'm definitely more open-minded to watching his 70s stuff. But yeah, this one again, you know, I was I sat down to watch it by myself and watched five minutes and stopped it. And I was like, oh, I think my girlfriend's going to like this a lot. So yeah, I waited till she was around to sit down with me and, and watch it. Yeah, and just like really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the story, the characters and the structure. I loved all the different kind of elements that were at play and, you know, just discarded as well, you know, from like the caretakers that we, we see kind of on the peripheries. Some of the family dynamics and then that stuff is looked at and then dropped and I just I don't know it felt like you know, yes watching a film but also like you've kind of walked into that auditorium where the uh, beauty pageant's happening and you're just trying to take it all in and it has that sort of energy to it that kind of I guess overwhelmed by the amount of people that it takes to organize something like this and all yeah. of the emotion that's that's plowed into it how important it is to some people and how irrelevant it is to others and you know how it affects the community I just thought it kind of you know all of those sound like weighty themes but they're just all gently kind of ticked off as the film flows through I just yeah this stuff is I, f I find it amazing that he's able to kind of balance all that stuff out and at the end you feel very satisfied by the film uh, yeah I think he's really good I think it's quite interesting to look at it in terms of the different styles of comedy it juggles because you made a point there about about picking things up and picking characters up and then they kind of drop out of the movie yeah yeah I think it has quite an interesting use of different kinds of comedy you've got quite broad crowd pleasing comedy possibly in you know in the shape of the two caretakers and then the the kind of antics of little bob and his friends um which which i think is quite it's not too offensive but it's quite clunkily handled and it's interesting that his his next movie was had had a cast of kids and it's much much better he got a, be a much better yeah. handle on it um and then you've got quite carefully written comedy it'd be very interesting to to see jerry belson's original script and see how it compares to what you've got on screen because i think it was probably a lot more of the zingers and the the more obvious <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> and the obvious kind of contrasts and and comparisons going on i think were on the page and then you've got a lot of stuff which just feels completely observational and, and kind of captured by That's chance it. yeah yeah and i know that a lot of that isn't and it's kind of like you know probably quite carefully rehearsed and captured and then kind of like spliced together carefully in the edit but at the same time when you when you use kind of found moments of audience members and stuff like that it sells the whole thing as authentic completely yeah and but i also love the stuff when you have the girls that are taking part in the beauty pageant just doing their sort of interviews you know oh, i want to help the world and do all of this stuff and you just it's obviously just let these real people talk and you you definitely feel like they're you know genuinely good decent people that you know want to make a difference without it being too kind of forced or um, contrived to win the competition yeah all the stuff with the kind of auditions and interviews and stuff with the with the contestants it reminded me very much of it's Milos Forman's first American movie which was called Taking Off and that's in 1971 uh, and that that opens up with a just this beautifully cut little montage of interviews for a, for a part in a stage show or for a beauty contest but it's got a really really nicely cut montage um, which reminded me very much of this and that montage harks back apparently according to an extra feature on the disc for uh, taking off to a documentary made called Audition um, oh, okay. apparently when he was making his, his first American film he had kind of this set up at the beginning and he thought well why don't I just go back to that structure and do yeah, that sure, again sure. It really works, but I, th I think Richie must definitely have seen that when he was making this, or at least you know Richard Harris's editor had. Yeah, yeah. There's um, is it Punishment Park that has a section in the middle which is just kind of militants ranting and raving when they're they're being interrogated, and it's the same thing. They just kind of they just cut loose, and it's it feels all very kind of authentic. And actually, while I'm saying it, it's also that section in the middle of It Happened Here where the um, the fascists are just rambling on as well. Yeah, and yeah, it's it's interesting you say things are kind of picked up and dropped. I, I do think there's quite a clever bit of structuring going on where the broad comedy is all up front just to kind of get you on board. Yeah, yeah, and then all, all of that's dropped halfway through. And there's quite a nice bit of structuring too as well because I, I kind of broke it down into a structure. But very loosely you kind of get like the rehearsals and then the shows and then suddenly there's this kind of like at the end of the second act there's this whole 
dramatic section and you only get very occasional cuts back to the shows and stuff going on. In fact, I think like the penultimate show is just like a couple of couple of very brief fragments. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And then the big reveal. Yeah, and then the uh, yeah, you get all the kind of dramatic stuff going on at once, and then you come back for the final show. Um, and you've kind of by that stage you've dropped the caretakers and you've dropped the kids and mm-hmm. and all that stuff, and you're just kind of into the meat and potatoes of it, and you don't have any of that introductory stuff anymore. So Michael Richley um, has a lot of the same contributors uh, here as in his other movies his editor Richard A. Harris worked with him right the way through um, through his career right through the 70s and 80s um, I don't know if we mentioned this on the Downhill Racer podcast but it's quite a quite an odd and probably quite a nice lucrative career change suddenly he gets he gets hired to do is one of the two editors on Terminator 2 yeah that's right <laughs> from that point on he's doing like The Bodyguard The Last Action Hero True Lies and Titanic I think he took a break after Titanic and then he did yeah, I'm sure two he did. more that movies that was a nice pivot wasn't <laughs> yeah. it it's a Cameron's world yeah and photographed by Conrad Hall who needs no introduction really <laughs> yeah that's it it's a lovely looking film um, yeah it's great it does again make me wish for a, a much higher quality transfer it's, it's frustrating when you're watching this and you, you can just imagine how beautiful those pictures would be at full resolution remastered yeah it's a beautiful looking film um i mean if you like 70s and 70s looking cinema this is definitely a film for you it's just like a symphony in, in beige and orange and pink and occasional pastel blues and those really hot hot white windows yeah and, and silhouettes some nice silhouettes in there too yeah I like it when uh, the character's at the fridge, or he's at the freezer and the door's open, you can see all the TV dinners inside, <laughs> and he's just silhouetted against them, like that's that's his world. Mm. Um, so the writer was Jerry Belson, who I know very little about. He also has a bit part as the drummer in the um, in the band. Oh, really? Um, that's funny. He, he's a TV writer, I think. Did, yeah. Um, from IMDb, I saw that he did like the Dick Van Dyke show and the Odd Couple TV show. Lucille Ball. He's credited as one of the writers on Close Encounters. What do you know about that, being the Close Encounters expert? I think basically everyone in Hollywood did a rewrite on Close (laughs) Encounters at some point. Yeah, Belson. I mean, that's why I'd like to see a copy of the the kind of, like, shooting script for this, because there's there's definite zingers in there, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, that's it. The line from... um, from Tommy French, you know, I've I've taken a bunch of innocent high school girls and turned them into yeah. Vegas Las showgirls. Vegas. <laughs> showgirls, yeah, that's a nice one. Yeah, and um, I can't remember his name, the little ginger kid. He gets all the kind of clunky innuendos. And... <laughs> yeah, I, I, have a, I have a feeling there's like a, a very, very polished script that's um, been approached in a different way, um, you know, with a lot of improvisation, a lot of kind of like captured stuff and then just kind of spliced together. Really yeah, that's nice it. Way. The script and the prep probably got them greenlit, and then they just did what they want. This, I saw a, a name in the credits um, who doesn't have a... She's only on board as kind of a design consultant, but do you know Patricia von Brandenstein? No, that's a pretty bold name. Yeah, I, it looked familiar, so I looked it up. She's had the most remarkable career. She's kind of like a design all-rounder. She did the costumes for Saturday Night Fever... And then as art director, she did Breaking Away. And as production designer, she did Silkwood, Beat Street, Amadeus, Working Girl, State of Grace, and The Quick and The Quick and the Dead. Wow. It's just like a, a, a design dynamo. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Wow, <laughs> what a portfolio. Yeah. So it's a story of uh, the California finals for the, I guess, All-American... Young, young American Miss, I think it's called. Yeah. And I, I Googled it. I was like, is that a thing? And it's, it's still running now. Really? I didn't look into into the pageant at all, but I looked into because um, there's the character Wilson Shears, who's uh, the representative of the JCs, which is mentioned. Is that the Bears? No, well, that's what I thought it was. Uh, that's just like a local chamber of commerce thing. Um, oh, okay, the JC- like a Rotary Club. Yeah, the JCs apparently, who are the organisers and sponsors of this this semi-fictional contest. Uh, it's the United States Junior Chamber, which is like a, a leadership training and civic organisation. You could be a member from 18 to 35, which is the significance of the 35-year milestone oh, yeah. for for Andy. It was only expanded to include women in 1984, okay. after yeah. a court case. Um, in 1976, there were 356,000 male members, as opposed to 12,500 now. 
So it was quite quite a big, yeah, massive American social thing. It was kind of like a, I guess, a Freemasons type thing for for young American yeah, men. Yeah. And so then is the idea that they're you know they're supposed to be presenting these young girls as being wholesome American marriage material. I, you know, is that what they're? I guess so. Given, I mean. They're grooming them almost for you know Stepford style <laughs> obedience. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it's the JCs funding the All American Miss contest. This is the California regional finals, um, with is it around like eighteen twenty girls from different boroughs. Yeah, different boroughs of California. They're they're then going into the, a national competition. I, I don't, God knows where it leads after that. Um, yeah, and it covers um, the rehearsals for. And you know the the three or four nights of of stage shows um, and the judging uh, and the, all the different characters, the girls and the organisers and the townspeople um, and their involvement in it. It's a big deal, right, for the town. I guess so. Yeah. I did a little bit of research on Miss World, and at that point, Miss World was getting you know like twenty million viewers worldwide. It was quite a massive phenomenon I thought by by now it started to fade but I think it carried on all the way through to the 80s yeah I think it was only sort of the mid to late 80s that it started to fade well in fact it's still running now Miss World it's another one of those surprising Google revelations that it still happens I think for a little while it was broadcast on Channel 5 after the BBC dropped it but yeah it still happens and I, I kind of felt like these sort of exploitative objectification competitions have been supplanted by things like Britain's Got Talent or um, The X Factor. I guess so, gradually. I, I personally think that these, in 1975, these things are kind of like a, a hangover from beauty contests being the only way that you could legitimately see, you know, other than movies and softcore porn you, it's the only way that you could see you know a woman in a bikini or a semi-clad woman uh, right. ob- objectified like, in that way you think it's something carried over from the 50s yeah from the 50s and early 60s and it's kind of like sort of becoming an irrelevance at this stage um, and then obviously like daily life seems to include women in bikinis and semi-nude women every aspect of, of kind of like modern culture seems to include that now so yeah yeah it's just it's just nothing really it'd be interesting to discuss given that this is a film about you know the exploitation of young women whether it kind of dips its toe into exploitation itself i would say in the whole no but there are just a couple of shots which are a little bit titillating where you're just like whoa okay. yeah there was only one that really stuck out for me i'll come back to it in a bit but, I mean, there are scenes kind of of the girls kind of undressing and, and getting changed and stuff. And I do think, you know, that's part of the reason perhaps some of the audience might have come to see the film or it might be a bonus for them. But, I guess, it, yeah. it, but it does try and have its cake and eat it a little bit with it, it kind of uses pop music over the top in a kind of semi satirical way. You've got California girls and, you know, yeah. you're 16 as well yeah. and that sort of yeah. thing. So it feels like a kind of pastiche of that sort of cheesecake thing. Yeah, yeah, that's it, Lemon Popsicle. Yeah, all that. But there was, like, the the very first almost introductory shot of um, Melanie Griffith's character, Karen, is of her bending over to pick something up and you can look up her skirt and it's like, yeah, it's whoa, a, whoa. It's a proper uh, up, up skirt shot, isn't it? Yeah, and it's very, very odd. It really kind of sticks out from the rest of the film. So if we have a quick look through the cast list, there's a lot of kind of, well, for me, there's a few sort of faces familiar from one movie for me. Yeah, sure. Um, but you got Bruce Dern as Big Bob. Uh, he's it's a very kind of scattered and very ensemble piece movie, but he's effectively the the lead, isn't he? Yeah, he's the thread, isn't he? That's supposed to keep it all yeah. together. I'd be interested to look back over Bruce Dern's um, kind of CV up to this point and see how how many sinister characters versus likable characters he played. Because <laughs> yeah, it seems like casting against type, you you would expect him to be kind of like slightly edgy and and sleazy yeah that's it well when the film started i was wondering whether he was going to be a kind of creepy perv you know because he's desperate to see the applications and the the girls but i think he genuinely believes in this yeah they they do certain american myths yeah 
they do set they set him up obviously he's, an, he's a salesman of RVs so he's like a used car salesman mm-hmm. um, and his patter is quite cheap and sleazy and, and yeah, yeah. but then you find out quite soon that he actually believes what he's saying he's 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 a true believer in the whole pageant and, and all of this mm-hmm. kind of yeah the celebration yeah the kind of patter and, and salesmanship you know his all his salesmanship is kind of based on the American dream but I'm wondering if, if at the time it was casting against type because he's always seemed to be kind of shifty and slightly edgy and unstable but I wonder if that's because I've seen him in subsequent films like Coming Home maybe he had that blend going on even then because you know thinking of Silent Running which was from what 1971 The Driver is the only other thing I think I've seen him in from this kind of period where ah was yeah that's that's one of his harder roles isn't it mm. But yeah, it seems really, like really useful, useful casting against type. Um, and he's got these amazing blue eyes. They kind of glow, glow like a Fremen's eyes, don't they? Yeah, he, yeah, but like a really kind of warm smile as well. Like, you know, he's he's always kind of happy to see people and ge- seems genuinely interested in their troubles, even if he doesn't have the answers to to their problems. But he's he seems really genuine. And he's kind of... It's a really nice performance because that that kind of genuine quality it does survive. I mean, the the script kind of constantly knocks him and sets him up with with foolish things to say and do. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there's the that kind of thing where he, he goes home and he's got the he's got this massive house. Um, yeah, it's huge. Which I thought you know it starts with an exterior of a car of a car pulling up to this building, and it, I thought it was somebody pulling up at a motel or something. But it's his house, and it's got all this strange kitsch stuff inside, and it's hideously decorated, even by 70s yeah. standards. It's the American dream made real, as exactly yeah. what you said. And he sits, you know, sits down beside his wife, and he says, hey, you know, when all this is over, we should go away for a weekend, just the two of us. And yeah. she says, you know, no little Bob. And he says, oh, no, no little Bob, um, thinking, you know, it would be a sexual weekend. He says, I was thinking Disneyland. Yeah. It's just this, he just is a child at heart for the whole movie. It's quite sad. It's quite tragic that the second half of the movie is is basically watching the wind get knocked out of this character's sails. But he's you know he's in, he's indefatigable. You know by the end of the movie you can see he's back at work and he's he's. I, I don't think anything could knock him down forever. Yeah, that's it. He he's, probably he's, had uh, you know one night's slightly disrupted sleep and then reset <laughs> and he's back to normal. Barbara Feldon playing Brenda, who's the um, organizer of the of the shows it's quite an interesting role um to look at now in the wake of um let's say mrs america which we had recently with kate blanchett as um phyllis schlafly who was um, an anti-feminist campaigner um throughout the late 60s 70s up until the 80s she wanted to oh, sort yeah. of she actually wanted political office and she kind of hooked, hooked herself to uh and enabled quite seriously ronald reagan's campaign and to get ditched at the after he's elected, but it's that um, it's that role of the woman who's actively campaigning against. I mean, I know that um, Brenda isn't actively campaigning against feminism, but you can see there's there's no kind of feminist viewpoint here, and mm-hmm. a lot of the kind of uh, contestants are kind of. There is one woman say, I, I I don't understand women's women's liberation. It just seems mm-hmm. silly. Yeah, yeah, sure. But it's the role, Brenda's role, as somebody who's kind of campaigning for traditional values and traditional women's places and positions in society. But at the same time, you know, in the process of doing that, she's carving out her own little niche outside of that and moving out into the world in the same way that... Yeah, it's kind of enabling her, isn't it, to be something more than just the young American miss that she was a former winner, right? So I think... But at at the same time, by kind of campaigning in a way to keep women in this kind of these restricted roles that the pageant allows so that was an interesting contrast for me to see that kind of performance back then compared to Kate Blanchett's but I like uh, so we have her as Brenda as a former young American miss and then we have last year's winner she comes in as well and there's that sequence where they all of the uh, contestants come up and give her a rose and they say goodbye <laughs> goodbye goodbye and they're just kind of pushing her back after all of this exposure i thought that was, there was something kind of cynical about that which returning winners are always funny did you see um drop dead gorgeous no it's really really good um and the returning winner in that is is uh, a young woman who's <laughs> she's almost at death's door with anorexia and she, she can she can barely kind of like get the oxygen into her lungs to breathe 
it's really really bitter and spiteful oh, and, and funny <laughs> yeah. so we got so we got Nicholas Pryor playing Andy who is uh, Brenda's husband who's experiencing a well he calls it a midlife crisis but you know at 35 I guess it's tied to this JC's thing of like being 35 you're an exhausted rooster uh, <laughs> yeah but it's more I think he's uh, a small town guy that wants to change of scenery right I think he's probably been married for too long and hasn't achieved anything you know he engraves trophies for a living and just I don't know it feels like he wants more from the world um, and there's another face um, that's familiar to me and to most people I think from horror there's Jeffrey Lewis who plays Wilson Shears the JC's yeah, organisers yeah. from Salem. he's a frequent Clint Eastwood collaborator as well so if you're a Clint Eastwood fan you've seen him in almost everything oh okay done. yeah, yeah that, friends. that rings a bell I've seen I remember him from Salem's lot yeah, it, obviously, um, any which way you can and any which way but loose. But I think he's in Josie Wales and yeah, quite a few Clint's. Oh, okay. That's um, Juliet Lewis's dad as well. Uh, I can see that now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got M Michael Kidd um, as Tommy French, the choreographer, um, who has a face who you feel like you've seen before, but he's, yeah. he's only got seven acting credits, so I don't think I have. No, no. Um, I really liked him in this, and I went straight to look again to see what else I might find him in and same thing it's like okay he's not an actor he is literally one of Hollywood's greatest <laughs> choreographers isn't he yeah he, he did that um, uh, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers sequence where they're all like doing backflips and on seesaws mm. and trampettes and things yeah it's really kind of dynamic but he's he got a choreographer that. it's great performance as well isn't it yeah really good really dry mm. and he his character um, has the only sort of barely redemptive arc in the movie, doesn't he? And then I guess the American misses. Um, you've got the, the the four main characters really, haven't you? Um, you've got Doria played by Annette O'Toole, um, who is the most pleasantly ruthless of the girls. She's absolutely driven. This is what she. Yeah, this is what she she's does. She's seasoned, isn't she? She's a professional. Uh, <laughs> pageant participant she's deeply cynical and to the point where when she says something cynical that she knows has crossed the line and offended somebody she'll kind of apologize profusely but i still don't know whether to believe her apology or <laughs> yeah, see if that's, that's still she's aware of it yeah that's, that's a nice touch mm. i like it she talks about winning um uh, miss teenage complexion <laughs> She's telling her friend about that, and it was basically some old dermatologist that paid lots of teenage girls to walk through his hotel room in bikinis. <laughs> and her friend is like, well, don't, didn't you feel exploited? And she's like, no, I won $200 and had a wart removed. Yeah. And that O'Toole in this raises some some mildly thorny questions of the male gaze, and because um, she is absolutely stunningly beautiful and engaging. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. And obviously, I, I am older than she was then watching it. But at the same time, yeah. you kind of get into those weird paradoxes whereby she is also much older than me in the real world. So is it yeah, yeah. is it exploitative for somebody my age to be extremely attracted to a netto tool in this movie when she's? Yeah, significant? it's a really big issue. <laughs> it's, 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 it's actually it, dangerous. It taxes me. <laughs> yeah, but I think yeah, like you say the 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 filmmakers also follow that thought when she does her um, <laughs> revealing your inner beauty sequence where she's wearing layers and layers of clothing that she seductively <laughs> strips off so we get this kind of physical strip tease whilst her monologue is talking about discovering your inner beauty it's <laughs> it's really nicely done um, we have a very young Melanie Griffith um, as Karen who's She's she has one kind of fairly mean thing to do when she kind of uh, sabotages Maria's um, pyrotechnic act, but she seems just the most down to earth and most normal of the girls, doesn't she? Yeah, that's it. We should have started really with Robin. We have uh, Joan Prather as Robin, who's our kind of identification character amongst amongst the young American misses. She's definitely the most kind of grounded not really a part of this in any way um, kind of fish out of water type character isn't she yeah she's feels like she accidentally won her previous heat <laughs> um, and there's a there's the brilliant scene where she's being interviewed by the judges um, 
um, and she has to be literally maneuvered by them into saying the key words when she wants to help others. Yeah, that's it. That's <laughs> it. Uh, it's really nice little moment in that sequence as well, where the priest sits forward and just starts talking about abortion. <laughs> no, there's, a, there's a little bit just prior to that where the priest kind of interrupts um, something that Big Bob's saying because he's desperate to get this question out. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> it. And I think because the film is set a year after California changes its law on abortion, so I think maybe for the church it was a massive issue at the time. So it's, it's good of the filmmakers to get that in. And there's a, there's a very kind of subtle arc with Robin, you know, although you're kind of weaving in and out of her and other people's stories, you do get the feeling that through hanging out with Dora, she's starting to get a little bit meaner and starting to, to get into it a little bit more. And by the end, she's genuinely excited and, and nervous when the... Yeah, that's it. I think um, she starts to invest in the competition and it's uh, it takes on more value in her life than it probably did when she first walked in. Um, and I I don't know if maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I felt that there was something subtle about the way that she was looking at uh, Doria especially. But yeah, she, had, she I thought she had a crush on Doria. Yeah, girl that's crush, it. Yeah. Interesting footnote about Joan Prather, the young actress who plays Robin. Uh, she was the woman who introduced John Travolta to Scientology in 1975. All oh, right. Apparently. Well, around this time. Yeah, it? exactly. And then there's Maria O'Brien playing Maria who's yeah. <laughs> she's hilarious she's the uh, Mexican American um, contestant who harps on and makes it the absolute kind of centerpiece of her yeah, yeah, that's it. of her of her act of, of everything is about being Mexican American as if kind of like daring the judges to yeah, not appreciate that there's a nice moment with her which I think is deliberate where she's dictating stage directions yeah that's where she lets the mask slip isn't it <laughs> yeah no, her, her accent goes this kind of really sort of broad spanish accent drops away and she's like listen buddy it's my it's not my first rodeo you know i want a blue light here i want this to fade when i cross fade when i walk on the stage that sort of stuff her father is uh edmund o'brien who was old sykes from the wild bunch there's one more young American miss, Colleen Camp, who we see at the beginning um, packing her suitcase. Um, and her her shtick is about packing a suitcase properly. And we see her like 30 seconds later dropping her, the contents across the runway as she's boarding the plane. Um, but she went on to, you know, f I say fame in the Police Academy movies, but she was also Miss May in Apocalypse Now, one of the bunnies. Um, oh, okay. When they chop her in, she's the one dressed as the Native American. All right, okay. So it's difficult to talk about this as narrative without going through it. I mean, I, I had a tough time with this because I watched it, watched it once um, to watch it and enjoy it and had a couple of drinks. And then the second time watched it to make notes and made notes on various aspects. And then when I came to like, right about thing it's it's so scattershot and so dense with bits and pieces yeah. that you know i've got a five page scene, scene by, by scene, scene. synopsis yeah, that, I, that i me don't too. i don't want to go through but was the only way to organize the movie in my head yeah because it is so fragmented you know the fact that you get to the end of it feels like it's held together and you only realize how it moves so quickly so effortlessly between all these different spaces and characters that it's only when you like say flick back through five pages of notes, you're like, oh my god, there's so much work happening there. Yeah, it's it's a, and it's a tough one to to pin down the tone as well. I just checked, and it's it's definitely like it came out the same year as Nashville. Um, oh, yeah, okay. And this one just uh, smile just kind of disappeared without a trace. It was it was you know, it was a flop effectively, uh, and then appeared on TV like the year after. Just got fast tracked mm -hmm. to television. But I kind of actually like it more than Nashville, and I think it's that kind of can't quite put your finger on it about it that that I like. You know, Nashville has dozens of characters as well, and it's bigger and expansive and slightly longer, but it has that consistent Altman tone. We are kind of disembodied cynic drifting through these things and picking up bits and pieces, <laughs> whereas this one is is more scattershot and collagey and and more difficult to 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 pin a consistent tone on. Um, and I kind of like that more. Yeah, I, what I really love is, given the subject matter, it could have been really condescending and could have been really spiteful towards the girls. And in fact, it's it's very respectful. You know, it doesn't at all undermine their um, 
commitment to the pageant you know it's and all of their you i mean we do get quite a few sort of funny montages of them displaying their talents um you know the, whether it's uh one of them playing the accordion another one badly playing saxophone and but those are funny because they're real, not because filmmakers are snide. No, it's absolutely it. They they retain their dignity right the way through. It's not about making them look stupid or bad or exactly. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, there's way, 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 way too much to unpack um, if we were to go through the film in its entirety. And I think the pleasure of watching the film should be something that we don't ruin if you haven't seen it yet. So it might be good to just kind of skip through um, and flag up anything that we like particularly as we do that. I would like to start with the bit that you mentioned just before, the basically the opening to the movie, which mm-hmm. is very important and, and, and kind of sets the tone nicely. You've got um, Miss Imperial County, is that the Colleen Camp character, yeah. um, demonstrating how to properly pack a suitcase to a, like a small auditorium of, of friends and family and townspeople. Um, and the cynical remarks from the judges. She's talking like, about leaving a sexy nighty on top. <laughs> Because you might need it first, and they're talking about whether or not that flies in in the uh, wholesome Miss America contest. She, she wins, doesn't she? And you get the the lovely kind of cutaways of kind of friends and family in the crowd. And I loved there's a, a black contestant right on the periphery of yeah. the show, <laughs> and I love her in that because you're like, oh wow, it's going to be really kind of like progressive, and obviously she doesn't win because it's the mid 70s but her expression of just like fuck this yeah complete you know, disdain so typical. <laughs> yeah yeah i thought that was really nice and to to you know load that up right at the front that miss american miss is going to be pink skinned fair haired you know that's why when you have maria gonzalez in there you know that's you can see the challenges she's already facing which is why she hangs a whole show on her <laughs> ethnicity we cut to the um opening title smile with the nat king cole rendition of smile Uh, and then we get this lovely montage of the girls preparing to leave on their flight at the airport you get a couple of nice glances from the uh air stewardesses that was the girls on as well that that is always the bit that 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 keys me into the tone of the film Mm just this kind of slightly i don't know slightly jealous or dismissive looks from the air hostesses it's almost like they've been through that right you know they're these air hostesses are probably 22, 23 years old, which when you're that age, the difference between 15 and 22 is, you know, so it's a lifetime. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's the air hostesses that, that really gets me every time. I, I really like that opening, that opening section. You know, you also have Doria kind of effectively ignoring a boyfriend to flirt with a couple of local officials before she gets yeah, on board. It. Yeah. That really sets up the movie for me, that introduction. You know, we see them on the, on the flight. We see, you know, point of view shots looking out of the window down at the ground so that we understand most of them have probably never been on a plane before and then we get uh, the arrival where where is it set santa rosa here we see them arriving in santa rosa and getting mini bust out to the uh, the venue but we get this really nice sequence where they're passing a mobile home that's being delivered and it has one one side missing so they get to look inside and the dream of like their own house you, you kind of get all of their aspirations from that so we get the girls arriving at it's like a veterans hall or something isn't it yeah um like a community center and that's managed by jeffrey lewis and he has a really nice sequence which made me hope that he was going to be much more prominent in the film but he kind of has this and one other scene and that's that's really him done but here where he it passes on a message from the janitorial staff asking the girls not to flush their sanitary towels, but the way he kind of chokes on <laughs> every word really made me laugh. <laughs> the way he sort of goes, uh, uh, please don't flush your sanitary <laughs> just, <laughs> just, 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 just don't do it. <laughs> just don't, just don't. Yeah, he's really good in that. And I was hoping that character would be sort of definitely buzzing around a little bit more. But mm. yeah, we, we kind of lose him. We're we're introduced to Big Bob, and then Barbara comes to see Bob, and they're talking about the name tags and stuff. There's just like a hint of of Barbara being a little bit in love with Bob, I thought in that scene, and then nothing came of it. Yeah, she. I, but I think she's more enamoured with his position as the the kind of head of the judges. You know, I think it's more hierarchical. That's why he gets the special gold badge. 
that was Monday, then we're on to Tuesday. Um, all of these days are introduced by lettering stitched onto fabric, which I guess is turns out to be Doria's underwear. <laughs> yeah, that's movie. right. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a nice, well, I say a nice reveal. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a good visual gag. It pays off nicely. On Tuesday, we meet uh, Tommy French. Uh, and start the dance rehearsals and music rehearsals. Um, with the music rehearsals, you liked the band leader. Yeah, the the band leader is William Trailer, and he was one of these guys. You know, like you say with uh, Tommy French. As soon as the actor pops up on screen, you're like, "Oh my god, I love this guy! What have I seen him in? I can't remember." And then he hasn't really been in anything. Probably the only thing I might have seen him in was uh, Buckaroo Banzai. But after a quick bit of research, it turns out he was. Uh, an acting coach and he set up uh, this place called the Loft Studio in Los Angeles the Loft on La Brea it was called and he taught Sean Penn, Johnny Depp, Jeff Goldblum, Lily Tomlin, Nicolas Cage, Meg Tilly, Angelica Houston, Michelle Pfeiffer like it just had like all of these Amazing. this jet whole <laughs> yeah, generation of actors that were taught by this guy who's like I really love him every time he's on screen he's a bit of a bastard but you know he's very transparent about his um contempt i guess not not for the show so much as the fact that that's where he's ended up as well that's where he's landed you know, that's, yeah that's his, his work one of the other musicians in a later scene in an aside turns to the other one and said I, I went to juilliard for this oh yeah his friend says we all went to juilliard for this <laughs> and then we have the you know the the local rotary club the bears club dinner um you can see doria working the crowd um and robin yeah robin this not I never really got this the Bears Club element of it, you know, the, the Rotary Clubs. I guess it is, like you say, like the Masons. So I think, you know, given that it's twenty twenty, the moment when they all put white sh white sheets on and white sheets over their head, I was like, "Fuck, what is this? What am I watching?" You know. <laughs> but I think don't judge me. But I think there is some awareness of that. Obviously, it's because even in seventy five, for for a, for a group of men to put white sheets on is just what you you know, we're yeah, yeah. you know we're we're less than ten years away from from you know, lynching still in the South. Yeah, sure. And sure. the civil rights movement only just had happened. So it's it's definitely like this is some of the ridiculous detritus that kicks around in small towns. Yeah. And I think if the film is cynical towards anyone, it's it is that group of men behaving like juveniles when they're slapping each other with fish and kissing chickens' asses and yeah. all of that stuff. It, that's probably its most cynical moment. The next scene, which is one of my favourites, where Andy and Bob are in the car and Andy's talking talking about his depression as they go to a drive through restaurant and the, the, his whole talk about hating his life and his town is broadcast inside the restaurant over the microphone and that guy's just stood there listening and he he picks up the microphone and responds like, don't leave town, Andy, it's all good and then he comes running out, doesn't he? And he's just like, please get me out of here, this is fucking unbearable. But it's a really good joke metaphor for the way that Andy feels, the way that his business is instantly yeah, everyone else's business and everyone knows everyone and everything yeah, in a small town. proper little town, <laughs> yes. It's it's really good. That really made me laugh. That, and I love it that Bob's driving a car off the lot that has, you know, white painted for sale sign on the back. Those little details really made me giggle in that sequence. When we get to Thursday, there's more rehearsals. Um, there's one of my favourite little visual gags. It's just like a two shot thing. Uh, it's basically like a, you know, you have the girls rehearsing in this in this space. Uh, and then you cut to kind of like the opposite angle and you've got like a bunch of young boys just watching. It's the <laughs> juvenile <laughs> court, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> it's, yeah. it's just perfect. Yeah, so they're all waiting to go in and they're getting a nice kind of yeah. free show at the same but time. But it's just one of those things where two shots says so much about, you know, okay, well, we'll just use any any available space to rehearse in regardless of what it means for the girls' dignity yeah, yeah. or privacy or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's set up quite nicely before, isn't it? Because we see like a first aid um, thing happening in... The, in the hallway a demonstration and then I think later on somebody's getting a tour of the building and they've all stopped to look in the changing room. French has a really nice line there where he's trying to teach the girls the dance routine and he's saying kick and bend and kick and bend and then he says to one of the girls no love if you kick and bend at the same time you're going to knock yourself out. <laughs> That's really fun. Um, we see Andy unhappy at work. We have the scene which we've mentioned before with uh, Maria being steely with backstage with the stagehand. Um, and then we get to meet the MC Ted Farley, would would be smooth small town radio personality. Yeah, yeah. A little bit of the yeah, that's it. Uh, he's he's Local a bit legend, isn't he? Yeah, he's he's less spiteful, but there's a bit of the partridge about him, isn't there? 
Yeah, definitely, so. definitely. <laughs> and uh, Tommy French tells some bullshit story to inspire the girls. And when this guy finds out that it's bullshit, he likes it enough just to use it anyway, doesn't he? Still, <laughs> still takes it because it's, it's just material for him. I like his introduction because there's this whole thing running through the first act about the girls blocking the toilets with their sanitary towels. At one point we have the janitor with his ear to the walls, you know, saying, listen to her, she's she's struggling, she's groaning, talking about the pipes. And then when uh, when the MC comes in, he just says, oh, so, sorry to hear you had such a big problem with the toilets. So that's like that whole thing is just thrown away with one line. Which I thought that was just really sort of cunning on the part of the filmmakers not to give us a big shit explosion and see the caretakers, you know, dealing with sanitary towels and block pipes. That's it. You just hear that it's happened. Um, they kind of write the caretaker out. He's kind of like collateral damage in, in little Bob's photography, isn't he? Because he's hanging around yeah. there and he gets caught as well. So we don't see him from that point on. Yeah, that's so it. He's, he's done suspension or something. Well, he does offer uh, Brenda his, his vodka, doesn't he? <laughs> After she's freaking out. And um, Jeffrey Wright's there as well, isn't he? He sort of is right there at that moment. So you sort of question whether all these men are kind of having a quick perv through the window or whether he's just doing his job. One of my favourite sequences is in there. Little Bob finally gets some film for his Polaroid and is taking pictures of the girls through the window. But basically he gets busted and he's denying it, swearing on his mother's life as he's hold, holding the Polaroid as it slowly develops in his hand to reveal his guilt. It's just a really nice like visual moment. Again, another one of those brilliantly handled scenes that really made me laugh. I'd imagine instant cameras as well would have been, it would have been a, a, a novel comic idea at that point, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we talked about Polaroid uh, prototypes in Alice in the Cities which is only a year or two before this mm. so yeah I think it's probably the hot consumer item yeah. at the time from Little Bob getting busted I think that's where we kind of plough into the, the long fairly dramatic section where you have uh, you know Little Bob and Big Bob go to visit the psychiatrist um, which is one of the, m the most kind of most writerly actorly seen isn't it it's it's a written comic set piece it's not yeah, one of, yeah it's, it's not, a nice sort of three-hander isn't it yeah compared to the kind of like the the snappy in and out structure of the rest of the film it does feel a little bit labored to me now yeah but i think there's something about big bob being so old-fashioned and you know the, the psychiatrist just holding a mirror up for him to consider himself you know it sets up nicely then when uh andy just slams him down i think it's it's part of slowly unpicking big bob temporarily mm. as he bounces back and following this there's the um well bob and andy do go to breakfast and andy seems a little bit more cheerful actually um but then at the end of that you get you get bob's story about his his date with liz taylor <laughs> yeah. which is one of the key scenes for his character because you know he's he was set up by by a friend who who was one of liz taylor's cousins uh, she never showed for the date, and from that point on, he's learned to expect a little bit less from life. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Which is why he's to roll with the disappointment. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it just sets up why his bar is set so low, and he's so constantly happy with with such trivial, fairly yeah, yeah. ridiculous things in his life. But that's it. But that, I mean, he, he's well aware of that as well, isn't he? That's the point of the story for Andy. It's and he has to stop imagining there's something better out there because there is. <laughs> that's what he's trying to tell him, isn't he? Um, you get a quick, quick sort of snatch of the penultimate show, which is with Maria's sabotage showpiece, uh, which, oh, yeah. which really does bring the house down. Yeah, it does. There's a really nice, I think, slightly earlier than that. There's a nice moment in the rehearsals where um, one, one of the girls faints, and both Doria and Robin are sort of slightly cynically happy oh, that maybe she's going to be out of the competition because it's one less person <laughs> but then one of the other girls just comes up and stands between them and says it's getting weird <laughs> you know like, like that's the point when you know people start fainting and passing out and when the pressure starts coming on when everyone starts freaking out i just love it that there's one girl who's seasoned enough to acknowledge like it's this is it <laughs> this is when it changes um, then we get the exhausted rooster ceremony, which has got one of the best kind of 
scripted moments, I think, where where somebody's somebody's talking to Bob about the pageant. Bob says, you know, yeah, one of the girls says her act was sabotaged, and, and the guy who's talking says, well, that's that's not right. We're supposed to be teaching these girls how to be responsible adults. And then yeah, immediately right. after that, he gets an egg thrown in his face, and it kind of descends into this, yeah, just, that's this ridiculous nonsense. I think that's such a nice counterpoint, seeing all these grown men, because it's just men dressed in sheets, slapping each other with food and animals and yeah. kiss, kissing a chicken's ass and Sim all of that simulating stuff. sex with corn cobs and all that kind of nonsense yeah that's in you know wanking off beer bottles <laughs> and you know i mean you know i was in the military i'm used to all of that stuff but <laughs> it does look so puerile and uh, pathetic compared to the sort of commitment and dedication that the girls <laughs> are going through in parallel mm. and he runs away from the grotesque exhausted rooster right it's a nice moment for him i think because at the start where he's just drunk he's laughing hysterically at all the guys and you can see you know there is a sort of frenzied kind of madness to the, these grown men acting like boys being drunk and then he just tunes out you can see the moment in his eyes where he's just like what the fuck is this after that, you get the Andy and Barbara confrontation. He goes home and she's got paper down on the rugs where she's just had the carpets cleaned and, and you know, she just isn't interested at all in his kind of depression and his belief that they should make some changes in their lives to kind of move on. He kind of blames her a little bit, I think, for how, how disengaged he is from his own life eventually he kind of managed to snap himself out of his kind of suicidal funk by by shooting her in the arm as it turns out but you, you yeah. just kind of cut to black and wonder what's going to happen i like yeah, i don't like that sequence i feel like it's you know it's quite an extreme reaction but i like what happens next where everyone just sort of ignores it and covers up mm -hmm. and you know even even brenda is just talking about you know and she turns up with a sling doesn't she for the final night her arm in a sling mm. And her friend is saying, he's lucky to be leaving a woman like you. <laughs> it's a really nice throwaway line. Um, Andy's in jail. Uh, Big Bob visits. And uh, Andy's kind of, I think a weight's been lifted. He's kind of, it's been cathartic to, yeah, yeah. to, to shoot his problems. Bob's talking his usual kind of evangelical. He's trying to be all positive and motivational. Isn't yeah, it? exactly. Motivational and... Andy listens to him, and I, th I think Bob uses one of the phrases that the, the young American misses. doesn't he? Yeah. It's very simple. All it takes is a drop more perseverance, a drop more optimism, and a drop more energy. Simple. Hey. Hey, wait a minute. I've heard that before. Never what before? That drip drop crap. Brenda read that to me. That's right out of the Young American Miss program. The good philosophy is good philosophy, and I don't happen to be a snob about where I get it from. And I can tell you one other thing. As your best friend talking to you right now, quit wallowing around in all this self-indulgent self-pity and get out there and start helping others. <laughs> Bob? I finally figured out what you are. Do you know what you are? A goddamn young American miss. Bruce Dern just nails the reaction there. This, this, this yeah. slightly petty, offended look on his face that he holds. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's nice. It's like that when you start to slowly deflate a balloon. He just has that <laughs> look, doesn't he? It? It, it kind of acknowledges the truth in that and has to live with that. But then we get that, like, the, the sucker punch right at the end where he's talking to the Marines and we realise, like, he's... He was a Marine and he fought for his country and the Marines just brush him off as like the guy that runs the beauty pageant. They don't even acknowledge his uh, his decorated service. Yeah, that was really carefully well withheld to the end that, wasn't it, that little? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's still dramatic after this. You've got the final decision going on for the judges, which for one of them is, is just a, a coin toss. <laughs> yeah, that's it. You get the, the whole sort of... Thing with the ramp being taken out and put back in and one of the girls goes tumbling off the end and is injured and you get like jeffrey wright's last brilliant moment where he says to her look are you okay can i get you anything do you need a doctor or a pepsi <laughs> <laughs> like like those things are, are on equal footing 
Yeah, and and I guess you you have the um, final the final show and the final presentation, um, the the unbearable tension of who's going to win, and and yeah. in a in a masterstroke, it's none of the girls that we've got to know. It's one of the just anonymous looking, yeah, that's right, indistinct yeah. females in the background. I, I think I read somewhere that Bruce Dern was talking about this, and he said that nobody knew who the winner was going to be. That was the point. They wanted that tension amongst all the girls and for it to be palatable on their faces. And I think that's true, but also like the the pure joy on the girl that wins you know you can see like it's the smile is so big it's kind of pulling her face you know she's really has no control over it at all it's it's really wonderful and the focus here is obviously um you know doria and robin's reactions you know, they're both see doria is more disappointed but is that there's the lovely moment when robin's mother arrives to take her away and she just absolutely yeah. snaps out of it she's back to the real world she's she's, yeah, yeah, she's got it. a real focus again uh, it's a lovely yeah, there's, and, there's a nice little exchange between Doria and Robin where uh, Doria says, you know, I'm just glad it's over. <laughs> no, I think Robin says, I'm I'm just glad it's over. And Doria's like, no shit. <laughs> <laughs> when you cut back to Doria after Robin and her mother have, have been reunited, um, you can see she's, she's slightly jealous of that real connection. Yeah, and I think because there's this sort of sub subplot that doesn't really lead anywhere, but Doria keeps telling Robin to talk about all that she's achieved with the absence of a father. And we never see Robin cash in on that, but we do see that really strong bond that she and her mother have. And I think Doria recognises that straight away. So, yeah, that's it. There were other moments in there. There's little bits that just made me absolutely laugh out loud. That, that rendition of Delta Dawn with the sax solo at the end was yeah. incredible. Yeah. <laughs> And I really like the fact that amongst all the talent demonstrations in the contest, there was actually somebody playing the piano beautifully whilst displaying her paintings, yeah. who was who was actually yeah, yeah. genuinely talented, but that just yeah, yeah. just disappeared in the in the wash. No, no and hope for that. And that's it. And that little throwaway moment of the um, the girl doing Shakespeare, which is like <laughs> really kind of moody and atmospheric, isn't it? And for that's, for a one shot thing as well, it's just beautifully lit with that infernal lighting. As yeah, well. yeah, yeah. It's really good. Yeah, and I like, you know, it's mid-70s, so I love, like, the, with the guys turning up in their it's black tie, but they've got those massive bow ties. They're so big. It's hard to imagine that that was ever a fashion, but, yeah. Well, coming, coming soon to Shoreditch, then. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so after the, uh, the tension and drama of the climactic final, we get a nice gentle epilogue where we, we get the reveal on Doria's underpants uh, having... The days of the week embroidered on. Them. <laughs> She's showing off to photographers. <laughs> For, to photographers, yeah, that's it. And then we see uh, the winner endorsing some local businesses, which I think is the um, electronics store that the boys go to looking for Polaroid film. Oh, okay. But, yeah, maybe not. Um, and we see Robin leaving town with her mum, and she sees Big Bob back in his uh, rightful position, not as the, the the powerful judge, but as the used car salesman yeah. in town. And then the very final shot, which is a kind of, it's a good gag, if not maybe a little uh, little booby, is um, the oh. cop that arrests the kids. We do get to see, um, we do get to see Tommy French leaving his, his motel room and it looks like there's a young woman discreetly bidding him farewell from there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I paused it because I couldn't tell who it was mm. um, and I still don't know. Do you have any idea? No, I don't. I, don't, I can't see no, who That's it why we need a full restoration <laughs> just to get the final final piece of that puzzle. And then the very final shot is the policeman that we meet very briefly earlier, uh, arresting the boys for taking Polaroids. And the cop has the Polaroid tucked into his car so that he can look at it whenever he puts the sunshade down. <laughs> and then we get the picture of Manly Griffiths' boobs as the credits roll. It just stays on that shot, doesn't it, all the way through? It doesn't look like Manly Griffiths. It looks like a body double to me. The hair looks bigger. Oh, yeah, okay, maybe. Maybe, <laughs> yeah. But then she wasn't them. she wasn't shy about nudity in the seventies, Melanie Griffith. So, no. Oh, well, be. this is actually the second film that we've reviewed that features Melanie Griffith and his boobs after Nobody's Fool. Oh, okay, yeah. As an aside, um, I looked at the poster for the, this film. I have it. Tag... Oh, I do. Have, you? I have it. Yeah. It's a... Do you remember the tagline? Uh, no. 
so the tagline on the poster says raised on hamburgers and soda pop she's got a willing smile that's hard to top a credit to her family the ideal team she's all america's daughter she's a beauty queen it's a beautiful poster as well i got <laughs> yeah, um, really nice. i got an original for something stupid like less than 10 pounds yeah there's, sure, sure. there's there's a period about 10 12 years ago there was a point where you could get, you know, you could get a, a Clute poster and a Parallax View poster, all of these originals in mint condition for stupid prices yeah. from, from, you know, from retailers, not on eBay, from, from private. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, and yeah, and that was, that was one of a, a slew of posters I got. I keep meaning, oh, nice. keep meaning to frame it because it's quite a modest size as well. So yeah, I, I love this movie. I, I wouldn't, try to oversell it because it is small and it is occasionally broad and I wouldn't try to sell it to a hardcore say you know Altman or Ashby fan as being of that that ilk but I would say it sits comfortably alongside it it would be a great yeah, definitely if you could sit down for you know any anything double build with Nashville entails a big chunk of the day but if you could sit down for five hours it would be a good double build with Nashville yeah definitely I keep putting it, I keep chalking it on the suggestions board at the Prince Charles, um, but that might be a bit of a mixed blessing because if they ever showed it, it would probably be some 35 mil print from 1975 that's faded and <laughs> yeah, it would be sh torture. Sh shredded and <laughs> taped back together and all over you the place. You can imagine the audio would be all over the place. Yeah. Oh my God, it would be shrieking. Yeah, no, you'd hate it. Yeah, I loved it, man. I was, you know, I was charmed and, uh, entertained and you know I've, I've felt for the girls and I loved uh, the stuff that you know I talked about at the beginning just seeing so many different people affected by this pageant I, I just thought all of that stuff was really well handled and I think it is a really sort of great example of 70s ensemble screen work based around one theme I, just, I yeah I just yeah no, I agree and the nice thing about it as well is that it's not dark and it's not cynical um, and you could yeah you know when you when you talk about 70s movies even when you're talking about you know entertaining ones like, like let's say shampoo that's a, a very mm. very very cynical film it's yeah. it's breezy and it's entertaining but you come away with a you know fairly sour taste in your mouth yeah that's it yeah, but this yeah, is yeah. you know it's a, it's a bitterness that underpins it yeah it? and it's got that slightly you know washed out um hal ashby quality but this this is bright and poppy and colorful and rich mm. um and you know characterful I, I really like it um i i try to recommend it at every opportunity but it's impossible to see without yeah and that's a, the big tragedy i think is that it just isn't on the menu mm. the reviews at the time were were odd I, there's the Jonathan Rosenbaum's one is up and Roger Ebert's one is up and I've got Pauline Kael's one yeah I read Pauline Kael's one and they're all sort of like yeah I really enjoyed it but it wasn't quite there you know it didn't and I feel that that everyone was kind of striving for a cynicism which the film doesn't need yeah you know, yeah that's it I was, I was surprised reading Pauline Kael's review that she was talking about that she sits down to watch Miss World every year. <laughs> I, thought, I thought that was a bonkers reveal and that she was kind of, you know, an advocate of pageants and that kind of thing you'd think as somebody so radical oh, right. would actually take so much pleasure from Miss World. Ebert's one came from another direction. He he said, you know, I grew up in, in a California town. No, he, he said, you know, where I grew up, there used to be a beauty pageant um, and it, he found it thoroughly depressing even at the time because it was all, you know, young young women that he knew and liked and they put themselves through this grinder for what purpose yeah, sure. uh, but yeah, but I guess that's the same with like you know my cousin lives in a village where every year they put on a, um, a Christmas pantomime and you know she's 40 odd now and, and still goes back every now and then to sort of reprise her uh, greatest, greatest <laughs> hits you know for the, for the local village I think there is you know if you take the cynicism out and just you know, enjoy the idea that people come together to put on a show for their local yeah. community, and it's, it's good-hearted and good-spirited. You know, I think that we kind of bring the cynicism to a film like this, where we're like, "Oh, the girls are being exploited," but you know, they are kind of enjoying the roller coaster as well. Mm. So, you would recommend it. I would recommend it. I guess we would recommend it. Were it, uh, were it available to watch? 